appreciate everybody being here. So the question is, and I appreciate the introduction. So yes, I'm based in Canada in the suburb of Toronto. So good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending where in the world you are to everybody. We're going to talk about why it's important to audit your GA4 property or properties. And from all these audits I've been doing, what are some of the, the top 10 most common errors people have? Now, I've been doing this, as mentioned, for a long time. Google my name, you'll find more than you want to know. Handful, my marketing people say, always oh, show some of the brands. Some of the are world-leading recognizable brands. Some are big Canadian companies, some are big US companies, some are companies elsewhere in the world. Great. So we're going to start talking about why audit your GA property. I've heard many people who bring us on to help them track new information and everything else. They look at their data and they go, data's coming in there. I see my sales. I see visitors. I see uh, channel attributions. So what do I need to audit? It's good. But how many of you, and this is where I, you know, I wish everybody could, you know, shout out, you know, actually trust your data. How accurate is your data? We know your GA4 data is never going to be 100% precise. It's not an accounting system. It's not, you know, your back end is Shopify or WooCommerce where you have to account for every penny. We know as analysts, as analytics people, we know little blips, lack, lack of cookie tracking, issues with consent. We're not getting 100% of the data, but there's always a good enough data sample to make good business decisions. And I've had people yell at me that the numbers are garbage or this is wrong. The This is why we have to audit it. So I'm going to give you a couple of the reasons why I always say we need to be auditing our pieces. We need to first of all determine if key data is missing. I always like to tell this story. It happened about a year ago. Picked up a client and they actually had done their switch to GA4 a year ahead of time of the uh, July switch because they want to make sure they had a year's worth of quality data. But they didn't look at their data. They didn't hire us to do their migration to GA4. And they started trying to find all this information. They realized half of their information was missing. And then we were in the panic to get up and running. So keep in mind that all your data you need, that you need has to be there. Are all the required dimensions and metrics reporting correctly? You'd be surprised at we people just drop in their you know, GA uh, JavaScript snippet into their website code and oh, it's collecting. And that's we know we should all know anybody who works in the product from an admin level knows that's not right. But what about the data collection? Is it in legal compliance? And we're going to talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. That is a big issue these days, and we all know about European and the GDRP blue rules and the new stricter law. So what data are you collecting and is it in legal compliance? And what about the integrity of the account? We will definitely be talking about that. How secure is your account and so forth? And obviously the most important reason is to generate confidence in the quality of the data. This is not, oh, this is for your marketing team. This is for your executive team. This is for any analyst. You need to believe that the data you have is the best data that you're able to get. And that when you do an audit, and I've recommended many companies, even if we've done an audit, 18 months ago, let's check it again because things change. So here are audit discoveries. And I'm going to go through the 10 most common things that come up in our audits. <clears throat> now, I've been working on in GA4 for over two years. We've done over, you know, over a dozen GA4 audits. Before that, I was auditing universal analytics implementations. In for GA4, we check 95 elements. Now, we're, these are the top 10, and some of them can get grouped, so we'll keep going through this. Just be aware of this. This is the biggest one. Whenever we start an audit, or when we start a GA4 implementation, we ask for the measurement plan. And I get the deer in headlights. I get the sound of crickets. They do not have a measurement plan. And for those here who are know what I'm talking about, you're probably nodding your head going, oh yeah, I get that all the time. We have to acknowledge that GA4 is a little bit less forgiving than universal analytics, or like I call GA3, where you just plugged it in, and for the most part, you got everything you wanted. Because of GA4's customization, a lot of stuff you have to set up and turn on ahead of time. You need to define your key events slash your conversions. But not for reporting, you know, 
are do you need for calculated metrics? If you didn't set them up, you may not be reporting on them when you come down the line. Do you need to set custom events? They need to be created, et cetera. And so what does a measurement plan look like? I'm gonna give you, this is an old school one that Google had put out years ago, but you start with your business objectives and strategies, right? Obviously, if you're an e-commerce site, sell more. Well, no, I always tell that's a bad strategy. Make more money, be more profitable. So you wanna sell, sell more of high you know, margin products could be a tactic. One might be get more eyeballs, you know, quality eyeballs to our site. You need to define your key performance indicators. If your client doesn't know what their key performance indicators are, there is a problem. And this is what you're gonna be checking when you do your audits. And that goes into development of custom reports and segmentations. Without this in place, you shouldn't actually have done your, they shouldn't have done their GA4 implementation. But if they've moved ahead, this is, you can do the audit to bring them in line and ensure that all the data that's being collected is in support of the requirements. And they should be maintaining their measurement plan. And if something new is added to it, then you need to make those changes in your GA4 setup. And that is why I tell companies, audit your stuff. Now, having done audits, and I'll be honest, only once in my life did I get a website, a uh, whole setup that was like, I was sitting in awe going, wow, this is incredibly done, We're perfect. I always find something. Now, I'm sure someone would audit my work. They find something they don't particularly like. Sometimes it's, I might do it differently than they did it. That doesn't make it wrong. It doesn't make it right. It's just different. And that's part of when you're doing the audits manually versus some of the automated tools that are out there. You might come up with, oh, this says this is done. Take a look at it. It may still work and it may still be just as efficient, but just not the way you would have done it. So keep that in mind. So with a measurement and plan in place, the number two issue that I find, and this is the first thing we, after we ask for the measurement plan, first thing we check when we're given access, admin level access to their GA4 property is, who has access to it? That is what you need to be asking yourself. And this is your integrity. I've seen way too many times where there is only one person with admin access. And you think about that, what happens? I've asked to get admin access, oh, that person's on vacation this week. That's not good. What happens if something happens to them? You know, the hit by bus scenario. Worse is nobody in the organization has admin level access. It's sitting at an agency, meaning the agency owns their data. We, you got to have so, at least one person in your organization, preferably two, be, have admin level access. You can give admin level access to some other people. So you, you need to be well aware you're, as an organization, you have it, and the integrity and the quality of the data is your responsibility. This also applies to your Google Tag Manager accounts, by the way. And then I've had accounts where we open this up and we see 50, 60 people who have access, might be able to read access. In some or large organization, that might be valid. But when I print out that list and I sit down with these people and they go, well, that person left the company, that person left the company. Oh no, they're in a different department now. Why do they have access to your data, especially the people who left your organization? And that is your integrity. This is your company's data. This is your company's property. By not managing who has access to it, there is potential data leak out there. People stealing your data, people seeing what you're doing from an organizational standpoint. Could be being hired, they could be hired by competitors. You need to maintain that. So that's, you know, amazingly how few people care about that pay attention to it until it's brought to their attention. Once again, as part of the audit, we then put in a program where they keep a list of who has access. It may sit with their HR department. If that person leaves, we need to be notified and they can check and keep that up to date. So just things to keep in mind. Now, this is the fun one. A lot of people implemented their Google Analytics 4 and at the same time are running the Universal Analytics but they still have their universal analytics tag sitting in their source code or sitting within GTM and they're active. They're giving no benefit because we know that universal analytics hasn't been collecting data for quite a while now. It potentially could be slowing down your website, which is not good from search engine optimization because there's an extra scripts that are running in the background. It could cause you some data loss because of that speed, obviously page load speeds. So, 
we need to, you know, do that. Now, as well as when you get into the admin, you still have a lot of sites where the people did the automatic migration. You know, they let Google do the migration to GA4 and they still have it connected. You, now I'm hoping uh, when they get rid of all the data in two weeks that they're gonna turn off and delete the old universal analytics properties, but who knows? Uh, maybe somebody here has that insight. So this was used when they were importing settings. So make sure you've disconnected your GA4 from your universal analytics because it has potential to mess things up. So that's it. So we'll get into number four right now, Con content sites. So these are for the websites. We're not talking e-commerce sites. I've done a lot, I did a lot of work last year with major food bloggers, with other bloggers, who their whole purpose of the site is massive amounts of content. How do you value a quality visit? Yes, they might have some affiliate links that they're trying to do. They might be trying to sell their book, great. But when you're running a content site, and this is something that did not come out of the box nicely with GA4, is page scroll. Yes, Google now says, you know, engage visitor. Great, they started scrolling. They spent, you know, their little more than 10 seconds. But if you're on a content site and your main purpose is disseminating information, you want to know how engaged the users are getting. So you generally want to have a greater level of breakdown. So you can define editorial policy. I did this with a client years ago and they realized that their content was way too long and that they were getting an abandonment rate. So they reduced the amount of words per post. Also, what about content groups? I'll use the food blogger industry. They might have a vegetarian, they might have meat recipes, they might have vegan recipes. They wanna know which ones are doing it. We all remember the Universal Analytics content groups. They're not as easily set up in GA4 and they could be missing. And that's looking for things like that. And we get into scroll tracking. Obviously, you can start to find this, and I still love using Tag Manager for this. Break it down, but you get ugly reports like this. And this is part of when you're auditing your own work. Look at the reports that people are using. Is there a better way of showing this? If you go back to that number one of having a measurement plan, they may actually want to know not just the number, you know, event counts that by percentages and total users. Perhaps that it's percentages. Maybe they want to make sure that, you know, 70% of readers of blog posts make it to the 90% level, or is it to 75% level? Now you can do create your calculated metrics and give those key performance indicators. And these are things that I see so often, as I mentioned, with these content sites, is how do you convert engagement into a valuable KPI for giving information to the people responsible so that they can make the right business decisions. And this is a fun one I love because I get access to the people's sites and uh, and I get that little pop-up message that says, something's not right. Click here. You get all these weird messages. Under the, the GA4 setup, you get a, usually a pop-up message and it all relates to, now I'll just showing you here the advanced setup options where they have not set these. They have not done them. And you're getting messages saying, hey, come here, take a look at this. So you need to confirm these, even if you don't implement them. Is it going to impact your data? Not at all. But it's an annoyance to anybody who has access to this. So make sure you mark them as complete, even if you're not using them. And that way it will clear the messages and all the warnings, because simply clicking to admit, dismiss only clears it till the next time. Now, this is another fun one, and we, you'd be surprised. Not all pages are tagged. They don't have the Google Analytics snippet or they don't have Tag Manager on them. Why? There's a number of reasons. Sometimes they're legitimate because they don't particularly care about a page and they don't want it counting for whatever reason. But a lot of times is when you're running a template-based system, maybe a page is using a template that doesn't have the code in there. How do you find this? So there are a couple of ways of doing this. One is use a crawler to scan the entire site to ensure it is 100% tagged. It's a bot, crawler, whatever term you wanna use. 
GTM code on a page. This is my favorite free tool, statsglitch.com. If you want, I put up a little, you know, remember stats glitch, but you have to navigate through it or you can just, I gave it a short new URL. This is what it looks like. You put in your website, you give them an email address, they send you a report back. And for those who have their phones out, if you want to look at the QR code and check this free utility out, wonderful, as I said, I don't own it. I have no stake in this company. I just love this tool. It works wonderfully. And what you get is a report that looks like this. I've hidden this client's uh, domain. It passed. So yes, the code was found. You get an error. Warning. And, I, and I'll show you another one where you, have, you need to go and look at those specifically because sometimes there's a little blip in the world of the internet and you might get an error that you couldn't find it. And you take a look and it's there and you go through the debug mode in GA4 and it's working fine. Great. But you need to do this. Sometimes, as I said, clients may have reasons. This particular client has a pages that they don't particularly care about and they don't want the noise in them. So I told them you should set up a separate account for those. But the way their site is designed, they weren't prepared to take that on. But be aware, and this is critical because this is the quality of your data. If you're not if all the pages you care about are not tagged, how do you know who's visiting you? They could be finding those pages through search engines. It could be landing pages. What are they doing? Are they engaging? You need to make sure. The alternative is, and if you're using technical tag map, you can use Screaming Frog. It requires the paid option. While well, there's a free version of Screaming Frog, you put the snippet you want it to go look for, and you can run it. It works actually a little bit better than the free tool I just showed you. But once again, some people don't mind spending out a few dollars for Screaming Frog. Some people care. If your site uses Google Tag Manager, there's another option available to you. And I love this one. And hopefully you'll discover this by getting a warning like one of my clients got. Uh, it's not, like all tools, it's not 100% accurate. One option is you could be getting this warning that it needs attention. And it's scary when you get that warning. But if you go into your Google Tag Manager admin screen, go into the property. I'm going to show you my company site, theconnectology.com. So I don't, I'm not embarrassed. At the bottom in that admin section under the container, there's tag coverage. And you're going to get something that it found 88 pages included, found 10 that are not tagged. It found one with no recent activity. So it's telling me 77 are tagged out of 88 pages. Great. Now I can tell you that there's that slash cap slash contact FP. It's an old part of my site that I don't care about. I've left it there basically because people have links to it and it's no value to me whatsoever. So that's why it is not tagged. So I'm aware that there's maybe reasons, but the first one, accuracy in digital analytics is a page. I got scared. Why is that, you know, showing me that? Well, you go to that, you go open up your tag assistant and guess what? It's tagged. Tag manager found an issue, a blip, but it's still there. So you still need to test everything and make sure before you report, but making sure all your pages are tagged is critical for data integrity. E-commerce errors, love this. It's amazing how many people deploy e-commerce. They might've been using their own universal analytics. They may have set up Shopify. They may have used WooCommerce or another product and haven't set up the events correctly. They name them the way that they like them named. It's it's mind boggling, but it's happened. And you get a report that looks like this blank. These are things that I we check when we go through our audits. This is the naming convention, the actual event name, not what you called your tag in GTM, but what you called it. So when you get them working, this is what they should be seeing. And they get the all the data. So once again, it's understanding all these components. And I've blocked off product names, but I've seen issues in this particular report where just the item names are not even showing up or the SKUs don't show up. These are elements that you need to check and they have to check that the definitions are set up correctly and match the requirements for parameter names as defined by Google. Number eight, this is always, everyone always likes to point fingers at this one. Errors in the use of Google's UTM parameters used in marketing links. 
in Google Ads, for AdWords, in email marketing, and social media posts, on, so on Facebook ads, Pinterest ads, uh, cross uh, posts on other websites, and uh, shopping sites, all sorts of things. People like to make up their own values for these UTM medium and UTM source. And for me, this is the area I look at, are the, unass the people that show up in the unassigned channel. Why? I then restrict, uh, you know, show me unassigned, show me source medium report, and I find some very funny things that people have done. And, you know, I, I won't even get to how many different wrong ways you can spell email or something else. Uh, they made it up their own thing, and Google has gotten far more restrictive on this, making sure that you're doing them correctly, and it's one of those lovely things that you need to concentrate on. What you need to do, this is a uh, short URL as much as I could shorten it for the GA channel groups. Google periodically updates this and adds new things in there. Use it. Share it with your marketing people. Show them their errors or their ways. Especially email marketers, they've come up with all sorts of things where they don't call the the medium email or or the source email. They've come up with their company that they're using for their email marketing wrong. Get it right, and that's you know just keep it going in the right way. Now we're going to get into missing or insufficient privacy policy number nine, and this is where especially with GDRP and everything else. You have to address the use of GA4 cookies. And we're going to get into this in a moment. Why? Are you using other tracking tools? Are you using Hotjar? Are you using Microsoft Clarity? Are you using uh, a chatbot that uses cookies that is not on your website? Those are things that you have to disclose in your privacy policy. And this is not only for Europe with the GDRP, but in Canada, we have our PAPITA. California has its own privacy laws. Every jurisdiction these days has its own privacy laws. And I've run into clients, I'm Canadian-based, U.S.-based, who says, well, we're in the U.S., we don't have anything like that. You know, stupid things like that. We can do whatever we want. And I check with your, your privacy lawyers. It also has to be easily findable by users. I had a client who had a wonderful privacy policy, and it was very clear and well executed for people even around the world. But you have to go to company info, then they had another section, and then we're like, contact us, and then it's like, here's our privacy policy. Why? According to Google, and this is the long Google URL, I'm not gonna, you can go search for it, and I know the box is a little small, you have to disclose that you're using Google Analytics on your site or your application, and that how it uses it, and that it's using cookies. We, most people don't realize this, that when we put Google Analytics in, we have to follow their rules for using their product. Now, is someone going to sue you over this? Probably not. But you are in violation legally. And if your lawyers see this, then they could cause you all sorts of grief. So make sure you put that piece in there and address privacy policy. And make sure your privacy also includes consent, especially if you're running in Europe under the GDRP rules, using something uh, like consent bot or, oh, I can, I've been working a lot with, I can draw the names here. You're having the cooking, you're asking people's privacy. It's that creep factor. People have gotten paranoid about cookies, even though I've been writing about cookies and why they're not bad, it's the use of cookies could be bad and people don't want to be followed. So you have to disclose it without their permission. So we need to constantly think about our privacy policy and use of consent. And yes, we all have those lovely pop-ups now that I can, and depending on which tool you're using, maybe you customize what the cookies are being used for, da, 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 and you can declare. And nobody ever tells you, check out my privacy policy, but it should be there. So ensure your privacy policy includes consent. Uh, you know, once again, and it's implemented. And verify according to the digital, uh, jurisdiction of your site. Now, as I said, I'm in Canada. We have our privacy law. And as I said, I love those American clients who are in the e-commerce world. They say, well, we're not marketing. We're not running ads in Europe. Great. I asked them, do you sell to Europe? Well, if someone from Europe comes to our site and buys, yes, we do. I said, well, then you have to address this. 
And they start arguing with me and I direct them to their legal counsel. You, the rules around GDRP and out, people outside of Europe, that it's still a bit of a gray area, but they give them specific information and wording that they can put into their privacy policy. And that is what you need to do. And I said the most common errors, making it hard to find and thinking that the law in another country doesn't apply to you. If you're in the UK, you have your privacy laws, similar to GDRP. If you're in the UK and you're selling to Canada, you have to be aware of our privacy laws. Those are things that happen. And the funny part is even on content site where people scroll down, and if you have a newsletter that you say, give us your email address and we'll send you sign you up, you need a privacy policy. And you'd be shocked at how many people do this and have no privacy policy. We're just getting down to the last few minutes. So we're just going here. And number 10, there's actually a 10A of this. Your GA4 dimensions are not properly configured. Yes, you... And this is primarily for most uh, analytics people who are installing this professionally don't do this. But I've seen a number of people just drop in their G Google Analytics code. You've turned on site search in the setup, but you've never added the event parameter to be reported on. Simple things like that are missing. I go in and I say they have a search box on their website. And I say, show me the search terms this company's been getting. And it's not there because they haven't done, and then they realize, hey, until I've added this, data may not be there. So make sure that any elements, events that you're tracking are defined and added. This is especially true if you're doing things through Tag Manager. People set up Tag Manager and have all these event firing, but they haven't set them up in the reporting functionality. And also avoid duplicates. I ran into this with a client, they were getting double counts on form submissions because they were using Tag Manager to report to report on forms because they were using form lookup tables and all sorts of things. But they also had it turned on through the GA interface. So every time a form was submitted, they were getting a double hit on form submissions and affecting their key events. So if you're tracking it in Tag Manager, you need to make sure it's turned off. And I'm just, that's gonna be it. So, right up on my 40 minutes here. So this is me. If you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, say, tell me, hey, you heard, saw me here on the GA Ward forwards. Uh, Google me. Don't, you know, don't forget to complete the uh, feedback form. Love to hear all the feedbacks. So it'll way that, you know, allows me to help. And I think we have just a couple minutes. Uh, I don't know. Will or Phil, you want Hi, to do some uh, today? Yeah, um, the... So people can put questions in in the Zoom uh, Q and A. The yeah on that subject of privacy, yeah we're um, uh, seeing more like more of the laws because we've kind of seen it ahead of time in in EU with these kind of cookie banners and everything, and those laws now have sort of moved across the pond a bit, especially in like California and the, the five other states. Uh, um, so um, the interesting thing for me is enforcement instead of in the uk where it's either four percent of global revenue or ten percent for big companies in the us it's actually more of a problem because it's not it's done based off class actions and negative pr and stuff like that so yes. uh, um it's kind of self-enforced rather than like forced i regulator enforcement uh but I have seen, I've been monitoring uh, some case laws with things like Hotjar and and actually on the last talk we had uh, Jody um, uh, who did it, uh, the Privacy for Marketers uh, event where she went through a list of, of uh, um, you know, some of the kind of open lawsuits and things to be careful about. For example, I didn't know that apparently Hotjar can be counted as a sort of wire tapping and things like that if it's capturing keystrokes and there's no kind of opt-in consent to to store it which is like that's a bit crazy it's like um uh so yeah no it's definitely more important now to make sure as, as you mentioned uh privacy policy foot a link opt-in for those five states and yeah if you're using hotjar or or any tools that is targeted by one of these lawsuits make sure it's behind a, a login wall 
Uh, yeah, the... well, that's it. I've been using a lot of Microsoft Clarity as opposed to Hotjar lately because they seem to address it a little bit better. Hmm. But they still, you still need to declare that you're using these tools or classify, depending on your lawyer. This is where I'm not a, I'm not a lawyer, right? And I've worked with privacy lawyers and everyone gives me an opinion and they're never the same, right? But some will say that qualifies as analytics, but you have to have the ability then when you close your account to purge the data. But what one of the issues I know with Hotjar has been they're using that data elsewhere. Yeah. Like that's right. They're, they're storing that data. That's not just into your account. Uh, that's one thing I mm. check with Microsoft Clarity. If I delete my Clarity account, it's gone. Mm. So that is, I'm not promoting one product over another. Believe me, mm. it's, I have clients who are using Hotjar and love it. And they've talked to their mm. legal counsel and they said, it's great. But once again, it's the jurisdiction. It's, mm. You're, I'm in Canada. My clients are in the U.S. I have clients in Britain. I have clients mm. in uh, Korea. Like it, each country has their own laws. Mm. But when you, if your site lets people from other countries into it, that's where the big gray area is. And some of the lawsuits now are that are happening, especially out of GRP. They're going after some large U.S. firms, and the U.S. firms saying, "But we don't sell there." But then why would you let people in? Yeah, yeah, it's like the the publishers where they say, "Oh, you can't access this site; you're from Europe." Um, right. Uh, it's you yeah. can't buy this book in Europe. Mm. Great, but I want to buy it and send send it to a friend in you know New York City. But it's it is a nightmare. If you're a big enough company, you're going to have a lot of legal fees all about this to make sure your privacy policy is coming through. Yeah, uh, I think it's it's definitely, and we're, we're obviously talking a lot about. Um, sort of backing up data but it's kind of a good opportunity to review as you as you mentioned like that um inbound kind of existing data um i do wonder whether in the same way that gtm's rolled out it's kind of basic kind of data validator or the gtm diagnostic if google rolls out a kind of some form of a data quality score because uh, a lot of companies they don't realize that it's not set up correctly that I don't think I would love them to do something like that, but I don't think from talking to people who have better connections in at Google than I do, Google really doesn't care. They're leaving it to you and your integrity. Their goal is to, uh, you had one of the doctors, you know, once you get onto BigQuery and get your data there so they can make money from this. Yeah. Oh, right? the, the, and, and, mm -hmm. You know, that's really where, you know, the issue is. Data integrity, that's up to you. Now, there are various tools that can check your data, uh, in, you know, audit, auto audit that your tags are nice and working, but I've used them and they're a great indicator where to go look, but it still takes that human eye until AI gets good at going through and saying, audit this for me. And as I said, reading a privacy policy, yeah, okay, there's a privacy policy. And it, but does it have the does it specifically do this? And every lawyer is going to write it slightly differently. And that's you know part of it. I've gone as I said. I my favorite one was the client had a year's worth of data before the switchover, but half of what they wanted to track was not being captured because they didn't use it. Julie said uh, at the start, it's kind of it's good to have a business question in mind first, even before you jump into the tool, uh, and then you figure out the uh, the answer. Well, that's why I, I always find having the measurement plan is the business questions, as Julie said. It's you built a website. This goes back from when I was building websites way back when. And you know, and web was a new thing way back when. And people say, I need a website. Okay, great. Let's start. What are you going to use it for? Let's come. And they'd be like, no, here's my printed brochure. Put this online. And it was like, but you have a printed brochure. It doesn't have to. Well, no, my brochure has a URL and I need something there. No, here's your opportunity to expand. Are you, is it, pro, you know, brand awareness? Is it to sell? Is it lead generation? Understanding what your goals are. Is it, you know, you you sell, you know, maybe you're in the plumbing business and you're selling, you know, faucets and sinks. Great. We're not selling. We're selling through retail. Great. But is it a way where you're going to honor warranties? Is it a place where you're going to talk about products, details? You need to know that measurement plan, and that's where you need to define your key performance indicators, make sure your GA is set up properly, and that those important elements are what are part of your backup on an ongoing basis. Because, you know, 
18 months from now, two years from now. So it was like, how are we doing, you know, in uh, June 2024 compared to now? And if you don't have those key data elements backed up and that they were accurate, you're out of luck. Uh, thank you again uh, for your talk, Alan. Right. Uh, and uh, um, some, some really useful kind of uh, like auditing uh, uh, tips and tricks there. Uh, and uh, I'm curious to know what your next kind of judging event is. Um, uh, I keep getting asked to uh, the Global Search Awards to participate, but I've been a little busy, so I've been t not taking them. That they're going to be coming up with some social uh, North American social media awards, so I'll probably be joining in onto that one, the social media marketing awards. But I keep getting asked, and they always have deadlines right when I'm in, tied up in other things, so at which point I need to... Uh, you know, opt out of them. So, yeah, they, they, uh, I've, um, we've submitted two awards in the past, but not been on the judging panel. So it'd be nice to kind of see what it's like from the uh, the other side of the table. It's it's interesting to read all the applications and why they get. And I'll tell you, for those who've been submitting, one is reason people don't get it is lack of detail. And the other one is lack of analytic or qualitative data. They just say, we did this award and we were tasked with a $5,000 budget to increase and we increased traffic. Okay, how did you measure it? What proved it? Like, so you see a lot of stuff and a lot of people think if they make the presentation look pretty, it's better. That's obviously a happy thing, but most of the judges are actually looking for meaning behind their results. Like, yes, you did this, why? It's not that we just threw money at it and look at the success we got. So keep that in mind. <laughs> yes, yeah, uh, uh, that's a good good tip. Uh, cool. Uh, thank you again for uh, doing a talk, and, and also oh, love pleasure. the background, uh, by the way. Uh, oh yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm an uh, old movie buff, so especially. <laughs> nice. Uh, okay, uh, I've right. got to. I've got to just keep things on timing. So. Yep. Well, uh, we'll keep you on time. Uh, All right. Thank uh, you, everybody.